All right, well, as we get going this morning, I want to take just a couple of minutes, and we're going to review Paul and his relationship with the church in Philippi. Because if you're anything like me, I too quickly forget. And this passage that we're going to look at today is sort of this crossroads of Philippians, and it makes all these different connections between what we've already talked about in previous sermons and passages. And so I want to have a few of those ideas and themes in the forefront of your minds. So Paul's relationship with the church in Philippi goes back about 10, 12 years from when him and Timothy wrote this letter that we're holding in our hands. And Paul and Silas were traveling as missionaries. They came to Philippi, and the first person that they met there was Lydia, who was a dyer of purple cloth. And they shared the good news and hope of Jesus with her, and her and her family became believers in Jesus and followed after him. They continued to serve in that city and minister, and while they were there, there was a slave girl in the city who had some demons possessing her and giving her a very real power and ability to predict the future. And her slave masters were exploiting this ability that she had for profit. And so this girl was following Paul and Silas around, And she was shouting out, these men are servants of the Most High God. And so Paul, in Jesus' name, cast these demons out of her, which is a great thing. Uh, But that was not a great thing for her slave masters, because that was the end of their stream of revenue. And so they brought Paul and Silas forward to the authorities in Philippi, and they accused them of advocating for unlawful customs and basically encouraging people to break Roman law. And that was a really big deal in Philippi, as we will see in a few moments. So this accusation against Paul and Silas got them stripped and beaten and thrown into prison. And you might remember the story from Acts chapter 16. Pastor Chris referenced it the first day we started the Philippian series. But Paul and Silas were there in prison and rejoicing amidst their suffering and singing. And while they were doing so, God caused a violent earthquake to tremble, and all of the jail doors came open. And the jailer that was there saw that all, as he recovered probably from being knocked to the ground, saw all these doors are opened, and drew out his sword ready to take his life, knowing that he had failed in his duty as a prison guard, and that his life was going to forcibly be taken from him the next morning. And Paul shouted out, Don't do it. Stop. We're all still here. And so he came to Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to be saved? And so they told him about Jesus, and he and his family believed. The next morning, the city officials told Paul and Silas, all right, beat it. Get out of here. And Paul said, no. You beat Roman citizens unjustly. You can come and escort us out yourselves. And so they did, and they apologized and asked Paul to not come back, uh, which he had no intention of abiding by. But that began Paul's relationship with this church in Philippi. And it was a very dear relationship between the two of them, as the letter talks about. And in the coming weeks uh, throughout Philippians, we'll continue to see that. But Paul then, some 10, 12 years later, is writing this letter, and he himself is in prison in Rome. And the persecution that he had endured there in Philippi has continued as the church in Philippi has grown and multiplied. And so he's writing Philippians in part to encourage them from his own example and from the sufferings that he has been experiencing and that they have been experiencing. One other important detail about Philippi before we dig into our passage here, is that Philippi very much valued being a Roman colony. They wanted to be structured like Rome, they wanted to look like Rome, and it was a favorite destination for career military soldiers who had retired to be there. And we're going to see later this morning how Rome and its influence uh, is some important background for us to understand as we dig into this passage. So if you would, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 15 to 21, 
If you have one of the Bibles from the back or on the chairs, that should be on page 1,674. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 to 21. I'm reading out of the NIV. We'll read through these and then we'll, we'll work through them and study them together. Paul and Timothy write, All of us, then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Okay, let's, let's work through these verses that are here. As I mentioned, this passage is sort of this crossroads of Philippians. And so in verses 15 and 16, Paul says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. That is incomprehensible unless we look back at what we have previously been working through and reading about. In the beginning of this chapter, in chapter 3, Paul began with his story of how he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, how he, more than anyone else, had reasons to boast in his heritage and in his lineage and in his accomplishments. And then in verse 7 of chapter 3, he said, but I count those all as loss compared to, compared to the glory of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And then in verse 10, a little bit later down, he talks about how he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and participate in his sufferings and become like him. And so what Paul is saying here in verse 15 picks right up on that, that all of us who have this view that he has just described, those of us who are mature are those who are continuing to seek and strain towards achieving that prize of knowing Jesus and being more like him. That's the view that we should have of these things. But then he continues in the second half of verse 15, and he says, and if some of you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Paul dearly loves this group of people, and he trusts that even if they're not fully seeing the picture of what full maturity and attaining to these things that God has has given for them, he trusts God's timing, and that God is working in this group of believers, and that God will make it clear to them. In the coming days. Then in verse 16, he says, Only let us live up to what we've already attained. In other words, we are responsible for what we understand about who God is and what he's done. We are responsible to work out our salvation in fear and trembling and strive to know Christ and be like him to the best of our ability with where we are right now. Then in verse 17, Paul says, gives this incredibly practical and encouraging word. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Now, if we review a little bit and we go all the way back to the beginning of chapter 2, Paul started out and he said to this church that had some disagreements and some quarrels and some things that were not the way it should be in a local body, in a church family. And he says, you should have the same mindset amongst yourselves that Jesus himself had, who made himself nothing and took the form of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In Philippians 2, he says, we should follow Jesus' example. But if you're anything like me, sometimes when you hear that, you can think of several reasons why Jesus is a little different than you or I. 
He knew some things I, I don't know and understood some things I don't understand. And he definitely did a lot of things I cannot do. But the good news for us is we have people like Paul who then sets out his biography and his story in the beginning of chapter 3, and he says, follow my example. Sometimes we don't know what it should look like to be a mature Christian, or we don't know exactly what we should do. And so not only can we follow Paul's example, because that is also not perfectly helpful to us who can't know Paul, but he says, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So look around. Look to your left and to your right and in front of you and behind you. And as you see godly examples of people who are mature in Christ, who are seeking to know him and be more like him, that's what we also should do. This is, this is so simple and so practical that I hope you don't miss it. But that also carries with it an admonishment for us to live in a way that is worthy of being imitated. The person next to you might be looking up to you and seeking to follow your example. And then in the coming verses, Paul's going to give us an incredibly sharp set of contrasts. In verse 18, he says, For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears in my eyes, many live as enemies of the cross Christ. Now, there is a lot of things that have been written about this, and there's as many theories as there are people who have written about it. Who are these people that are enemies of the cross of Christ? I'm not going to speculate with you, but Paul lays out four very clear characteristics of these people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. And what is clear is that he had previously discussed these things with the Philippians, and so they certainly knew exactly who he was talking about. It seems pretty clear that there was an understanding at some level of who Jesus was and what he had done. And these enemies of the cross of Christ are people who have tread lightly upon who Jesus is and what he's done. And Paul defines them by these four things. The first one is that is their destiny. He says their destiny, in verse 19, is destruction. They are on a path that leads to their end. Secondly, he defines them by their worship. He says their God is their stomach. And this was not a compliment in any way, shape, or form. Because... Back in that day, to be described as someone whose God was your stomach didn't just mean you liked food. Uh, It was an insult on a number of levels. It was basically saying someone was animal-like, driven by their instincts above all else. This was a person that you could not trust to look out for your own interests or for the better interests of those around them because they are dominated by navel-gazing and by their hunger. This was a person you couldn't trust because they were said to be people who flattered other people to tickle their ears and say what they want, all as a means of attaining what they think will satisfy them and make them happy. Their worship is directed at their bellies. Then he continues on, and he says their values are off. Their glory is in their shame. That which they should be embarrassed that they do is what they are broadcasting and proclaiming and being known by. They should be embarrassed in it, and instead they are reveling in it. And then finally, and maybe the one that hits closest to home for us, he says their mind is on earthly things. Their focus is not where it should be. It's on the here and now and what is immediate, and what is graspable and attainable. Then he gives us the good news. In verse 20, he says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, to unpack what this meant for the Philippian church, we need to do a little bit of Uh, familiarizing ourselves with what it meant to be a Roman citizen. 
Roman citizenship was a prized commodity in the ancient world. Only about one out of ten people had Roman citizenship. And it could be achieved by three different paths. The first one was the easiest, if you got lucky, which was to be born to a Roman father. Either you were or you weren't. The second one was much more difficult to attain. You needed to serve with loyalty and faithfulness to Rome in the military for 25 years, and then you might be able to attain Roman citizenship. And then the third path to Roman citizenship was if a Caesar or a uh, powerful leader granted citizenship to a specific person or subgroup of people. There were three separate registers that kept track of who was a Roman citizen by these three different paths, those born by birth, by military service, and by grant. Roman citizens were given a small plaque to prove, basically a wooden plaque to prove their identity, and it was confirmed by seven witnesses so that if it was in question, it could be validated and verified. And to be a Roman citizen was a precious thing. There was a number of privileges and rights that Roman citizens had. They were the only ones who could vote on certain elections in Rome. They had privileges of attending theaters and public festivals. If someone was killed and they were not a Roman citizen, Rome would not investigate it. Rome only recognized the marriage of Roman citizens. Roman citizens were protected from certain tax privileges, not all of them, but some of them. And finally, as we see throughout Paul's life, a Roman citizen could not be beaten without a fair trial, as had happened to him at Philippi. And if a Roman citizen believed that they were not going to have a fair trial in whatever place that they were at, they could appeal to Rome as a Roman citizen. And Rome sort of acted like the Supreme Court. There was no higher authority, so the decisions of Rome and the emperor could not be questioned or appealed because there was no higher authority than appealing to Rome, which Paul did later in his life, and which is why, partly, he was in prison in Rome writing this letter. So Roman citizenship was a prized commodity, and throughout Paul's life we see that he used those rights and privileges at certain points. But in Paul writing this letter to the church in Philippi, nine out of ten of them, this would have been something that they have only longed or dreamed or hoped that they could attain. And for the small 10% or less who did have Roman citizenship, they intimately knew and understood some of the privileges that they had. And Paul here is making a greater than, less than comparison and saying our citizenship is heaven and that is so much more precious and so much more valuable than what 25 years of military service or birth to the right family can grant you. Our citizenship is in heaven. And Paul's not done there. He continues and he says, we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we use the words Lord and Savior a lot in church. They're in a lot of our songs But these two titles were two of the favorite titles that the current reigning emperor of Rome, Nero, used to identify himself. And so for a very correctly Roman colony like Philippi, they would have heard this and heard Paul saying, Jesus is Lord and Savior in a way that Caesar never has been and never can be. He is a protector and a deliverer in a far greater way. And to those people who never had Roman citizenship, there's the opportunity to be wanted and to belong to Jesus, who's delighted to have them as his people and citizens of heaven. And then he continues to talk about how Jesus has the power to do this because of the power that he has to bring everything under his control. This is a reference back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, where he talks about how at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess in heaven and earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means even people like Nero, who's persecuting Christians in Philippi and in other places around the Roman Empire, that means even other military 
armies throughout the history of the world, every one of them and every one of us is going to bow before Jesus. And Jesus is going to put them in subjection under his own power. That power that he has as he is reigning in heaven right now is the same power that he is going to use to transform our lowly bodies of humility and suffering like what Jesus experienced and what Paul experienced and what we experience to be like his glorious body. A glorious body fit for eternity and never-ending joy and delight in the presence of Jesus. This is the precious inheritance, the rights and privileges that we have who have placed our faith in Jesus. As we start drawing our time to a close, I want to take a few moments and tell you the story as Ben McIntyre tells it in his book, The Spy and the Traitor. It's the story of Oleg Gordievsky. Oleg Gordievsky was born to uh, KGB parents. And as a young man, he became a KGB operative located in Denmark in the early 1960s. Mid-1960s, I'm sorry. And his job in Denmark was to basically go around and try to steal the identity of dead citizens and use those as new fake identities for Russian KGB agents. But while Oleg was stationed in Denmark in the 60s, he became disillusioned. He went into libraries and realized there wasn't a list of banned books that he couldn't read. That there was freedom in the West. That there was art and beauty and music and literature and all of these things. And he realized that what he had been fed from infancy were lies about the West. Lies about freedom versus a communist state. And this was made even worse for him by firsthand witnessing the other atrocities of the Soviet Union with other Eastern European countries as they would come in and sometimes massacre local populations to establish their dominance and secure their borders. This was enough to make Oleg Gordievsky reach out to the West to become a double agent for them because he was committed to tearing down the lies and propaganda that he had been fed. And so he used his post in Denmark to smuggle secret information to the British in MI6. He did this for a number of years, and then he was brought back to Moscow for four years of assignment there. And while he was there, he committed himself to learning English. The Brits did not contact him for four years, ris risking and fearing that they would blow his cover. And then one day, their wildest dreams came true. Oleg had become a colonel in the KGB and had been stationed to one of their chief offices in London. In the nuclear arms race of the 1980s, Oleg was personally responsible for de-escalating the incredible political and military tensions, and he personally smuggled out documents that found themselves in the hands of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and American President, as pictured here, Ronald Reagan. Unfortunately for Oleg, the CIA did not like not knowing where this incredibly valuable information was coming from. And so they assigned one of their officers to investigate and find out where this information was coming. And so they tasked a man named Aldrich Ames to find out who this was. And through a process of elimination, he figured that there was a young, high-placed KGB agent in London who was responsible, probably an up-and-coming guy who was responsible for all this information. But to the Americans, the British, and Oleg's dismay, Aldrich Ames was himself a double agent and had been bought by the KGB. And he ousted dozens of other people who he was afraid would turn on him and reveal him. So he tried to basically have them killed before they could reveal who he was. 
Because unlike Oleg, who would not take money for what he did, but did it on principle, Aldrich Ames was broke and unhappy and seeking an easy paycheck from the Soviet Union. And Ben McIntyre goes on to tell the fascinating story of Operation Pimlico, where the Brits, Oleg was brought back to Moscow once Aldrich Ames outed him. And they brought him back under the guise of a promotion, and he was almost certain that they were going to kill him. But he knew if he didn't show up, it would guarantee that outcome. So he went back to Moscow. They drugged him, they poisoned him, and interrogated him. And through all of that, he never revealed who he was or what he had been doing. And then he asked the Brits to, to begin their operation to extract him. And it cost the careers of a number of British agents in Russia at the time to get him out, but they smuggled him across the Finnish border, where to this day he lives in anonymity in England. This, this story of Oleg's life and his willingness to spy for the West and give them this information is a stark reality to us because it cost him his marriage. He wasn't able to see his children until after the fall of the Soviet Union, but he had next to no relationship with them. It cost him his friends, his family, his career, his livelihood, and many attempts on his life. But to him, it was worth it for the goal of dismantling these lies that he had believed and the hope of freedom for the people he loved. And I offer this story as an example to you of how much more worth it it is for us who are citizens of heaven to endure the hardships that it takes to follow Christ. And honestly, I don't fully understand how Jesus is going to do this. But when he comes back, which we eagerly await, he is going to take every sleepless night, every tear that you have cried, every bit of loss and suffering that you have endured. And somehow he is going to take those things and gloriously transform them for our good, for our glory, and for his glorious sake. And so this morning, I want to leave you with this. Are you a citizen of heaven? Is your focus on the Savior who we, who we eagerly await. If it is, like Paul, press on. In those moments of doubt, believe it. Believe that what God has said in his word is true and that it's the best thing for us. Continue to run the race, to know Christ, and to become more like him. And if you are here this morning and you are not a citizen of heaven, if you are someone of whom it could be said that your focus is on earthly things, then I implore you this morning to become a citizen of heaven by placing your faith in Jesus. Because Jesus is the Savior and the Lord that you have been looking for and that you have been longing for. And you will never find peace or rest until you find him. Place your hope and trust in him.